Welcome back to the administering SQL Server 2012 Jumpstart. I'm Rich Curry. This is Mr. George Squalachi. We have the geeks in the background that are helping us out. Thanks to the geeks. Yeah, without them, you would not be seeing this. So absolutely, absolutely thanks to the guys behind the camera. All right. George, what do we got coming up now? So look, Rich, we're four modules down already, kind of unbelievable, but this module, again, a very important module, something that you just have to get right. Remember, it's your fault. It always is my fault. Just ask Elise, she'll tell you. So implementing security, a bunch of topics to look at, uh, and going to the overview, we have uh, onion layers, I suppose we could describe, onion layers of security that we can set in SQL Server, and we want to take a look at, at each one of those layers. Okay, I'll use the proper term, scopes of security. We have server level scope, database level scope. We want to investigate the levels of security that we have, um, serve level, database level, and then uh, some strategies that we'll use for implementing permissions. That's right. the big picture, big picture for this particular module. So let's start up at the top. What do you think? Sure. So in this particular topic, we'll look at, in general, the security scopes, list them by name, give you a picture to have in mind that will help you uh, put your mind around uh, what the available scopes are. And uh, then look at some other things, authentication, uh, authentication modes, uh, and then allowing someone to access a SQL Server instance. Then we'll take a look at some administrative activities at the instance. So that's coming up. All right. Big picture. Uh, the point of the diagram is to show that there, is, uh, there are security options or there is security that can be applied at several different scopes. Up at the instance, and you see some example objects that can be controlled that are instance level objects. Um, then uh, we have database scope objects, schema scope within a database, and ultimately, and most granular, we have individual objects within a database that can be controlled. So could you talk about scope as kind of like a container? So it, like a, the database scope is inside the server scope and the schema scope is inside the database scope? Yep, think Rolling Stone. And okay. Not so much in the sense of the music, but if I happen to assign permissions at one scope, generally speaking, and depending on the permission, those permissions are going to roll downhill, bless you, roll downhill to the other scopes. <laughs> There are some permission-specific statements that you'll see. Um, I like, uh, in particular, in one of the courses that I teach, where it talks about the grant statement, and it says something like, quote, the grant statement is a very complex statement. There are a lot of options, but at least the point is obvious of uh, we're giving access to something. All right. So moving along. One of the first important security decisions uh, that needs to be made is the authentication mode. As you can see from the lower right, this, can, this decision can be made during installation and can also be changed uh, after the fact. So it's a little bit tiny, but you'll see two radio buttons which uh, permit solely Windows authenticated access to SQL Server, alternately Windows plus SQL Server logins. So basically, you can always use your Windows identity to log in, but SQL Server logins have to be specified specifically. Got to throw a switch on, and there's a cost. Uh-oh, what's the cost? The cost is that you're going to have to restart the instance, restart the database service uh, after you make that, that change. So anytime you change security, you got to restart the instance. Well, anytime you change that in particular, for the sure. Authentication, yeah. okay. Now... <laughs> For those that have a lot of SQL servers, consider this. What actually changes is a registry key, which means then if you wanted to change the mode universally on a bunch of SQL servers, you could actually set up group policy to change the registry key in the policy and apply that to your fleet of SQL servers. Restart them, and you are good to go. Very cool, very now, cool. you'll notice with a Windows identity, that's something that's already defined in Windows, but... Uh, if you go back for just a second, in the upper right, we're seeing that we could create a SQL login, which is thumbprinted, so to say, to this particular SQL server. Quick little side note, starting with, uh, I think this was SQL 2005, you now can have SQL logins 
pay attention to the underlying Windows password policy if it's a server operating system. Yep, yep. You set right. it in AD and then SQL Server follows along. Yep. So let's move on to login, pardon me, login objects. And uh, this slide <laughs> caters to those that might be newer to SQL Server. And I'm trying to make it very obvious how someone ultimately gains access to objects within SQL Server. Think of this. Think of it as clearing three separate hurdles. First, I have to knock at the front door and furnish identity of who I am. Okay. And not only do I have to prove who I am, but then I have to show that I'm invited to the party. Okay. So we refer to this as authentication and authorization. Now think about this. If you go in, this is a sort of a private question, but let's say you go into well, one of your friend's houses. You're going to wander around and look inside the medicine cabinet? Uh, I hope not. No. So similarly, once I get through the front door of the SQL Server, I may okay. not be able to wander around everywhere in the instance. And we'll see from the second hurdle, my login object, which is created to permit access into SQL Server, must then be registered at the database level. To back up for just a sec, notice that logins can be derived from a few different sources, a Windows account or a SQL Server account and they also can involve Windows groups. Okay, why would you use a group instead of individual accounts? Well, it has to do a little bit with, we'll just say turf war. If I want Windows administrators to manage groups, then I could pass that off and let them populate, but generally it's a measure of efficiency. Okay. So that's a good point to bring up. Now at the second hurdle, I have uh, uh, user objects that are then registered at each and every database where I want to log in to be able to do something. Similarly, just because I can enter through the front door of a database doesn't give me access to everything within that database. And this brings us to the third hurdle. This will be toward, uh, what we'll look at towards the end of, the, uh, of this module, actually gaining access to objects within a database. And there are a few different strategies that you can use for this. Now, when it comes to uh, the tools that I'll use to build all this, Yes, like a lot of things we've seen, I have the graphical user interface. Absolutely. Like we've seen before, I have code-based methods, create, login, alter, drop, etc. Yep. There we go. And along with these login objects, they have configurable options. All right. Not a lot of options, but some. All right, so next up, let's take a look at uh, uh, administrative uh, capabilities at the instance level. So we'll refer to these as server level roles, server level permissions. Now, <laughs> think of being on a cruise ship. Okay. So being on a cruise ship, boy, you would really not want to fall from one of those cruise ships because a cruise yeah, no. ship no. isn't going to be able to stop on a dime. It's not going to really be able to turn on a dime either. Hope you can swim. So, so the comparison here is that there are certain things that have been part of the SQL Server product that have been around for a long time and they're hard to let go of. Okay. And in particular, I'm referring to server-based roles. Sometimes they're called fixed server roles, namely because I can't change their name, I can't change their permissions. The one thing I could do is add or remove members. Okay. Drum roll, please. We have some product excitement. Uh-oh. Something new? Something new. Now in SQL 2012, finally, we have the ability to create our own server-based roles. You'll get to see this coming up in a moment. Party favors and cheers, please. There you go. All right. <laughs> DBAs awesome. have been screaming for that one for a long time. Yeah, namely because uh, often the fixed server roles granted a whole lot more than you would normally want to for any particular purpose. So that really made them null and void. Um, so in order to create uh, both server roles and to be able to assign more granular server level permissions, we have a few tools that apply. Any surprises? We have Management Studio. I would hope so. Well, we also have a system store procedure if I want to use code to add a member of a role and if I want to create a role. So you see those two uh, code elements there. So would it be safe to say then that if you don't want to assign specific permissions to a user, you use you create a user-defined role yes. and assign the permissions. Yeah, good strategy. Awesome. All right, so guys, if you'd cut over to my virtual machine. Let's go take a gander. I'll collapse a few things to tidy up. 
and we'll focus at the instance level here. So notice I have the security node, and under the security node I have server roles. These would be what we would consider as fixed database roles. Now, having been with the product for a long time, I, I recognize these names. These are, are all fixed roles. Not a single role is a, a non-default role. These are all default roles, so to okay. say. So with the graphical user interface, I now am able to create a new server level role. So let's call this administer logins. All right. And now I'm able to grant access to the particular logins that I might want to grant access to, whoever those might be. So I have one selected. I could grant the control permission. And of course, I'm able to script out almost any graphical user interface activity and put all of that in code. So now that I've created the name of the role, the permissions of the role, this is where I would determine who the members of the role are, and now I could add members. Just as an aside, that script button, that is a great way to record the stuff that you're doing to your database, to your instance, so that when you try and go back and figure it out two days later, you can actually remember it. Yeah, are you a, are you a record keeping kind of a person? When it comes to databases, I am. Yep, all right. All right, so next up, I'm going to create a couple of logins, and uh, as I'm able to create a login with the graphical user inter interface, you'll see that I can also create logins in code. And you'll observe from the names here, these are not Windows naming conventions. Mm -hmm. A Windows naming convention would require a machine name or more likely a domain name a backslash, and then a name, which means that these are SQL logins. Okay. And what are those options that you've got set on there, like default database and check policy? Yeah, so I, I think I skipped this, uh, pointing this out on a slide before. I had a little picture of a laser pointer on one of the slides and skipped uh, stating what the relevance of that was. When a user successfully connects through the front door of a SQL server, they are always, repeat after me, always, always pointed at a particular database. So using the default database option says when someone comes through the front door, their laser pointer, so to say, is pointed at that particular database. Now you can move your laser pointer with the use database statement, but this sets up a, a default option. And also, you can determine whether you want a SQL login to forcefully adhere to a Windows password policy or not. When you do, that seriously raises the security and safety of SQL logins. So that would be like password expiration and complexity, things like that? Perfect. I'm glad you brought those out. Awesome. So I can't remember if I ran this or not. Okay, I didn't. Otherwise, I would have had an error. And with the refresh notice, I have a bunch more... Uh, a bunch more objects. So at this point, I would be able to go to the instance. Uh, let me just look at a couple of those names like, okay, Bob and Brandy. Go to properties. Go to properties of the instance. Go to okay. permissions. Now I see the list of logins. So let's say Brandy, we want to grant her, instead of membership in a role, Maybe she's a developer and we want to grant her create any database. So grant create any database with Brandy being selected. Awesome. Now maybe Jane needs more authority than that. And once Jane is selected, now I assign her a grant control server. There's a general principle I want to bring out about create any database and that is um, if I have the ability to create something and I exercise that privilege, then I own the object I created, and if I own it, that's supreme. I have ultimate control over it. Awesome. All right, so that shows how to create a server-based role, how to create logins, and how to assign them privileges. And now in code, you'll see how I can create a server role in code, now, grant a permission to that particular 
uh, server level role. And now add a member to that role. Neat. I want to uh, give you guys a little phrase here that might help you out. <coughs> Principles are assigned permissions to securables. A principle being something that can be granted access, a securable being something that is protectable within the system. And then a permission ties them together. All right, I think that was all, uh, all that I had for that one. No, uh, just server scope permission. So I also have server scope permissions, grant control on logging, grant create any database. So that's a code-based version of what we saw. Okay. And then uh, uh, a connect permission. So. So if you've got server level security set up, does that automatically give you permissions and abilities to act within a database? No. So what we've just looked at is clearing the first hurdle, both in the sense of getting into the instance with a login and then having administrative privileges at the instance. We're now going to echo that, but at the database scope. So we'll take a look at getting access within a particular database and then administering a database as well. So we'll see in this topic, uh, we'll look at creating database users from logins. We'll take a look at database level roles and a nifty trick, something uh, uh, you may be familiar with, maybe not, called application roles. So off to database users. All right. So what is a database user? How do they work? A database user represents the second hurdle of the three hurdles in my picture, and we see that in order to gain access to a particular database, my login at the instance level needs to be registered at the database level. I, I could have an instance with 50 or 100 databases, but I might have only access to one. So whatever databases I need access to, I'm going to have to have my login registered at the database level in the form of a user object. Now, I may want to divide the responsibility of administering a particular database, and in that case, I also have database level roles. Similar to the instance level, there have always been fixed database level roles. Their name, uh, they're called fixed for the same reasons. Okay. Can't change their name, can't change their permissions but I can change membership. All right. Also similar to uh, this server level, um, in general, they give away more privileges than I would want to, so we'll often uh, have an alternate technique for granting administrative privileges. These, uh, this would be solved in the form of a user-defined database role. All right, now application roles. Um, I explicitly describe those actually in a slide or two, so we'll get to that in a moment. So can we talk a little bit more about those database level roles, George? Yeah, so you'll see uh, from the screen capture here, I can, let's see. I had to see, just get my bearings there. So I selected It's been a long day. Yeah, been a long day. <laughs> in fact, if you guys will cut over to my machine, I think I'd rather just show this. So I'm going to navigate to a particular database, expand the database, go to security, and from a confusion standpoint, notice that I have security at the instance level, but each database also has its own security node. I think this can be confusing at times for those that are new to the product. So when I go to roles, I have database roles, and once again, this represents my fixed set of database roles. Okay. I also have users defined, and if I want to have a user registered at this particular database, so that would be the, the fancy DB, when in doubt I'm going to right click, I'm going to choose to create a new user, and from here I'll define the classification of user that I want. A SQL user with a login, we'll talk about this shortly, or a Windows user. Okay. Notice the form changes Yep. based on my choice. If I have a Windows user, I'm going to obviously have to pick the location of that Windows user and then either grab a group or I'm going to have to grab a, uh, a Windows user. Okay. Right. Or I could grab a SQL login and in this case... Uh, 
You give it a username, right? I'm going to have to go ahead and pick what particular login it is. And this is where I'll see the laundry list of logins that I made. I don't know why I picked more than one, so I only wanted to pick one. All right, so that's how I would create a, a, a database level user. Okay. Except, notice the foil there. You need this to is, have a username. Yeah, this is, even though this is derived, whoops, I lost my mic there for a sec. Even though this is derived from a, a Windows login name, Strangely, the name doesn't have to match at the database level. That's this, a good thing. Yeah, this could be a good thing because I could have something like a, a lengthy or obtuse Windows group name and maybe make a friendlier name uh, within the database system. But for right now, I'm just going to do a quick copy and paste, make that easy. So if it makes sense it, it, for traceability and being able to track back through, it probably makes sense to name the username and the login the same thing most often. You know, I think so. I'm, I'm kind of Captain Straightforward, and I think, honestly, <laughs> as I age, I like Straightforward more and more. All right. All right, next up, uh, and I'm kind of I kind of jumped ahead to our demonstration since it was convenient, but... That's all right. We talk about it while we're doing it. So now going to database roles, notice I can create a new database role. This particular part of the feature has been around as long as I've worked with SQL Server, so at least all the way back to SQL 2000 and probably way before that as well. So I would identify pools of people either administratively or uh, within the database that need some access and I would come up with a name that represents the kind of access that, that they need. So something like healthcare table access. So really what we're talking about is people that serve the same function rather than have the same identity. Exactly. So after I make a role, that would be one of the legs of this. I should say after I create a name, then of course I'm going to have to add one or more members. And notice the members that I can add here fall within these classes. Either users, so logins registered at the database level, or strangely, I can nest a database role within another database role. Be careful about over-engineering that. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and add, even if it's only one person. <coughs> now, the final part of this story, and I can't give this away just yet, is assigning permissions to the role that we're going to take a look at a little bit later. All right. So what about application roles, George? Are, are user, are database level roles and application level roles the same thing? No, in fact, um, let's go ahead and cut back over to my virtual machine for a second. See, there are some smarty pants out there, and some of the smarty pants have uh, connected some dots. Okay. They'll say something like, well, hey, I can use this application. It connects to a particular database. Maybe somebody gave them some details. They know what the server name is. Maybe they even know some of the objects they would access. So they could do something like this. In fact, I don't even remember if I have Office on this machine, but let's say we did. Hey, we got one. So now I could go ahead and make a connection directly to a SQL server. And if it was based on my Windows or SQL credentials, I'd be able to make a connection and manipulate objects completely outside of the application's logic. Wait a minute. Are you trying to say to me that a user who's got access through an application, if I create their username, they can come in some other way and still get at the data? At the moment. Oh, dear. Yep. So one of two things is true, Rich. That's the way that I want it, or... Mm. That's not the way that I want it. Mm. So, so what I, if I don't want it that so way? So if that's not the way that I want it, I actually have a control. Let me go ahead and get out of this first. I like to think of Superman when I think of uh, application roles, and here's why. What you want to picture is someone going through a telephone booth. Clark okay. Kent, let's say. He goes through as one identity and comes out as a new identity. Generally speaking, something with more privileges. Okay. So in that case, uh, I can set up an application role, which we'll observe involves creating a name. Let's call this uh, pharmacy access. Okay. And you'll notice the elements or the building blocks here. Just, whoops, just like, oh, that's smooth. 
Okay. Just like with a regular database role, it has a name. So okay. da da da. And just like a database role, it has securables or those things that I want to assign permissions to. Okay. What's different is this part. Whoops. This part. All right. That's so, got a password. Yeah. So notice this has a password and notice it does not have members. I, you know, I was looking at that and I was wondering how, how does somebody use the role Excellent. if you don't have membership? So let me just put in a dummy password here so that I'm able to complete the creation of this object. Okay. And uh, that will be the activation password. So let me go back, uh, if you go back to the slides for a moment there, troopers. All righty. Now what I need is my front end application. I'm sorry, I have to back up. So I'm a human and I open up an application. I okay. open up a web URL, I open up a Windows application. That application is going to have code behind to make a connection to the database. Okay. From there, it will bear my credentials in interacting with the database, except if I have an application role, I have a statement that says, this connection is going into the telephone booth and coming out as somebody different, but the end user does not know that this happened. They neither know the role name, nor do they know the activation password that I just set up. So, so SQL's not giving permission or allowing access based on who they are, but rather by code telling them what they can do. Exactly. So only based on what their role dictates will they have access, which means then if Smarty Pants user would now attempt to use Excel and attempt to make a connection to the database, that they wouldn't have any permissions because okay. they would be assigned to the application role. So there we go. All right, awesome. and that's going to take care of our, uh, our demo coming up of uh, us implementing database level security. So the last piece of this then is really going to be permissions. Yep, so now we have object permissions or uh, uh, implementing permissions, object permissions, code and module permissions, and we have to get to some permissions management strategies. Okay. Let's take a look then at object permissions. All right. So I have a, a broad class of objects that are contained within a database. We have tables, views. You see there are a bunch of other objects there. Object permissions apply to those particular objects. Now, there's a phrase that I used earlier. If I have to do something once... I'm probably going to need to do it more than once. Probably going to have to do it again. So I would tend to want to avoid giving permissions to single objects and when I can leverage a better strategy. Meaning if Susie needs access to table one, then she's probably going to need access to table two or a broader base of objects. So that means now I'm managing access on an object by object basis. So the other thing is, Susie may be here today, but she may go, and that means now I'm going to have to take Patty or Mikey or somebody else and assign them all the same security that Susie had. Okay. So let's see if there might be a way that we, we can improve efficiency there. Um, as far as object permissions are concerned, it depends on the type of object. So I might need to change the structure of something like a table. Maybe I need to add a column, uh, add a constraint, so alter permissions might apply. Another possible permission is broad control where I have uh, really unrestricted access to a particular object. Now for objects that hold data such as a table, we have data manipulation language uh, uh, statements that we can execute, select, uh, select permission, insert, etc. And then finally, that what I call the tattletale permission. The tattletale. I might want someone to be able to look at the code that defined an object, but not have them change the definition of the object. That's a minimalist permission. So we have the view definition permission. Awesome. Now, are objects the only things that you can set permissions on? Or are there other things that we're going to need to deal with? In addition to uh, objects like tables and that, we also have uh, executable T-SQL code objects, such as stored procedures, and certain kinds of functions. Okay. 
So they also have permissions that apply to them. Some overlap, but not a perfect overlap. The primary permissions that apply on a code module would be the execute permission to use it. So if I wanted to use a stored procedure, uh, execute it within code, I would need, well, the execute permission. Okay. So how do you set up these permissions? How do you get them to applied so that you can manage everything? Sure. Consistent within uh, SQL Server, we have uh, Management Studio. And uh, within Management Studio, I can start with a principle that is, let's say, Mary needs permissions. I can get properties on Mary and then point her to the particular securable. Alternately, I can go to the securable and then bring principles that I want to assign permissions. So it kind of depends on, well, somewhat preference, but also um, if I need to assign a principle to multiple objects, start with a principle. If I have a securable that needs multiple principle assignments, start with a securable. Okay. So there's no crime either way. You'll, you can get the job done. All right. Now, if I want to do it in T-SQL code, I have my normal uh, DCL uh, statements, data control language statements, grant, revoke, and deny. Should we talk about those for a minute? Absolutely. I think right. they're important. So when uh, I have this nice candy bar, thanks Microsoft, I saw that out in the hallway here. Let's consider this as uh, a precious resource of some kind, and it is a good one too. Okay. All right. Let's consider that this is some precious resource that I have. If I want to extend that to someone else, I Thank use you. I use the grant statement. If I eat this now, that's going to cause you problems. Right? <laughs> <laughs> now, let's say I had provided something to Rich, and I no longer want it to be that way. I can take it back. That would be a revoke statement. Um, there's another circumstance, and that is when well, Rich, you're right next to me. I'm going to pick on you. Okay. Let's say you're a member of a role. So. You're a member of a role, let's say it's the sales role, and I grant you access uh, to a particular table. I grant the group access to a table. And maybe that group is granted access to uh, a number of different tables. Okay. But there's one particular table the group has access to that I don't want you to have access to. Uh, are you picking on me? Absolutely. And in this case, I'm kind of at a fork in the road. Okay. Neither road will be easy. One road is to create another group with the same sales members except you. Okay. And that means now I have to manage two separate groups and remember when to use which one. This is not tidy. All right. Perhaps the path of lesser evil is to keep you in the group, assign the group permissions to the table the group needs, and then I explicitly assign you the deny permission. So that's one way that may reduce my overall effort of administration, but you have to do that sparingly that can make your troubleshooting somewhat more difficult. So you can either let me do it by saying you're granting it to me, or you can tell me, no, you can't do it by denying me. Exactly, and there's one more kind of strangeness. Let's say that I gave you a negative. I gave you a deny. Okay. I can actually use the revoke statement to remove the negative. Oh. So keep in mind, removing a negative is, is also performed with the revoke statement. So grant makes an entry, deny makes an entry, revoke removes an entry. Good observer, you know, good point to make. Nice. And then finally, there is a security anomaly that's been fixed in SQL Server 2012. This is... This uh, goes back a long way, too. It goes back a long way. But prior to when I was working with the product, yep. uh, I mean, it's been in there as long as I've known. Namely, I can have a table-level deny and a column-level grant that will succeed. I didn't really talk about column-level grant, so you're learning two things here. First, yes column level grant has been around in the product for a while where I grant just certain columns. Uh, but the anomaly of a column level grant overriding a table level deny no longer exists. Everybody say ah. ah. All right. All right, so what about the strategies? How do we apply all this stuff? What are some approaches we can take? All right, I'm gonna take pain somewhere. 
Usually. So it's just a matter of where I want pain, and normally I would, it's always better to take pain up front. Okay. And I coined a term here. I'm going to be famous for this someday. Double abstraction, and I want to tell you what I mean by this. <laughs> We're going to review a couple different ways to implement permissions. Ultimately, here's my phrase, you want to make sure that you design so that the design works hard for you rather than make you work hard. Makes sense. So at the far left here, we see that we could have a, a couple of database objects and use our uh, database user objects and directly grant them access to those objects. The thing is, maybe one of those is Bill. Bill might come and go, so now I have to remove Bill and then I'm going to have to add Susie and grant her access to all those objects all over again. Okay. Remember, the work stays pretty much the same, yep. but the worker changes. Yep. So I can improve this a little bit in the next model if I use something like a Windows group. So at least a Windows group will have members, uh, although I'm still taking the group and directly assigning them access to objects. Still, maybe not the greatest idea. But the odds of getting rid of a group are probably less than getting rid of an individual Absolutely. user. Absolutely. So this is definitely an improvement. Okay. Now, even better uh, is using a database or an application role, and I've used them interchangeably uh, for, for this particular purpose. Again, the work is going to stay pretty much the same. The workers will change. So I can create a semi-fixed relationship of assigning permissions from a role to one or more objects and then just manage membership. So this is where you want to aim. You want to aim for managing membership and not doing all the granular permission changing. That way you assign the permissions one time and then you just add people in and out instead of having to keep changing the permissions. Exactly. I like that. And in the next model, I raise this just a little bit by using Windows groups that are added to database roles. Now, okay. in fact, I skipped a little detail. You don't add a Windows group to a role. You would have a login defined from a Windows group. Then that's registered at the user level, which is then made a member of a database role. Okay. Now, so then, that makes a lot of sense, but what about permissions at the object level? I mean, is there a way to group things there? In fact, what we see, this is the drum roll, big conclusion. Thank you very much. Hey. We'll find that all objects are contained within schemas, at least certain data accessible objects, uh, stored procedures, tables, views, etc. They're contained within a schema. The fancy part is that we can use schemas to collect objects that need uniform permissions, like a bunch of stored procedures that a pool of people need to execute, okay. or a bunch of tables where people need to select and insert into, not delete, not update. So I can pull those objects inside a schema, grant permissions to the schema. Now, in this case, I get double, easy for me to say, I get double abstraction. So on one end, I can add or remove objects to the schema and not have to assign permissions to them. Because the permission was assigned to the schema, I don't need to worry about permissions to the individual object. So I add another stored procedure, it needs execute, great. Now the other end of double abstraction, instead of having to assign permissions, when I get a new Mikey, a new Sheila, I just add them as a member of the role. So I have abstraction on both sides of the permission equation, and Rich, you're excited about it. I'm absolutely <laughs> over the top. I can't wait to see it, actually. All right, so let's So go. how about it? Let's move on to that. All right, let's go take a look at the demo. And in this one, we're going to be playing with those permissions that we were just talking about. All right, so let's go ahead and create, let's see, I made a database role. And next up, let's go ahead and create a schema object. Okay. So let's say I create a new schema. We'll call this the manufacturing schema. I like that. Do you? Yeah, it means we're making something. All right. All right, now let's see. I have to look at what database I was in. So I was in the fancy database. Let me make sure I'm pointed to the fancy database. And now we'll create just a couple of objects, create table, and uh, we'll get the schema name. 
dot T1 for table one. Just make something sort of silly. Yep. Execute that. Easy table. All right, next up, we'll make another table. Actually, this time, let's create a procedure. We'll call it P1 for PROC1. as select star from manufacturing dot t1. Okay. So, so we've right. got a table, we've got a procedure. We've What's next? We've got a next? table and we've got a procedure. Okay, so now using, of course, both the GUI or code, I'm going to take my role and assign it to the schema. Which okay. way do you want to start from, the role or the schema? Oh, surprise me, George. Okay, so let's start at the schema. I'll go to Properties. We'll go to Permissions. Okay. And this is where I will assign a database level principle, a user or a role. Okay. So on one end, we have the abstraction of objects being in the schema. That's already been set up. But now, let's go ahead and pick a role. So object types, we see database level objects, and now let's pick the particular one. All right, pick whatever role we want. The one we're picking isn't material to the demonstration, All just right. uh, by virtue of uh, picking a role. Okay. And so now I have the three legs of the permission stool, so to say. I have the, uh, I have the securable, that's the schema object and the items in it, I have the principal, and now we have to combine those in here, sorry, in here, and uh, grant a permission. So let's say we have execute, grant execute for stored procedures, and grant insert and select for tables. S, whoops, it comes lower in the alphabet. <laughs> It right. has been a long day, hasn't yeah. it? <laughs> All right. I'm having trouble remembering my alphabet, too. There Don't worry. All righty. Uh, we have a few minutes left with this session. Can I take a little bit of liberty here, Elise? Yeah. yeah. Go okay. for it. Um, there are a few resources that I want to direct people to. Uh, in particular, uh, some websites that have uh, email subscriptions. They'll send some stuff daily to you uh, in your inbox. So at the expense of piling up a little bit of mail, I've been immensely benefited by uh, being a subscriber to some of these. So um, in some form of follow-up, well, we'll make sure we get this. Uh, we'll make sure we get this to you. But to list them by name, here are some of my favorites. First, MSSQLTips.com, a great one. So MSSQLTips, there are lots of contributors, lots of real smarty pants that uh, contribute there. Another one. SQLServerCentral.com. Pretty parallel sites in terms of uh, what they offer. Um, Email-based subscriptions, tips, code, lots of great stuff. Um, another one, uh, these are from, uh, these two are, at least one is a former Microsoft employee and they live here in Seattle metro area. Um, this is Paul S. Randall and Kimberly Tripp's, uh, uh, their group. Um, SQLSkills.com. An interesting thing, Paul Randall is a big book reader and he'll often tell you what he's reading. He reads some crazy stuff. So uh, when I say crazy, I mean a broad variety. That's pretty nifty. So thanks for putting up uh, uh, the web URLs. And then a couple of other things. Um, Rich, would you add up uh, SQLSaturday.com? Mm -hmm. There are SQL Saturday free one-day training events if I can all, spell Saturday, I'll yeah, be happy to. All over the planet. And I got to put in a little plug for SQL Saturday, Kalamazoo, Michigan, <laughs> coming up in November. You know, that would be that one right there, huh, George? You know what? We'll have people come from Chicago, Ohio, all over Michigan. And there's some real smarty pants that work hard and contribute a lot to that event. This will be my third SQL Saturday, Kalamazoo. Great, maybe my fourth, but really good stuff. And I just want to point out that it, these are not just events that are here in the U.S. As you can see from the listing here, Lima, Peru, Ancona, Italy, Slovenia. So 
you know, no matter where you're viewing this from, check this out because there may be an event that's pretty close to you and you can get the benefits from it as well. Um, two more if I can. Uh -oh. um, for, you know what, I think we'll save one for the BI one, Pragmatic Works. We'll, we'll wait on them, but okay. one more. Go to SQLPass.org if you would, please. SQLPass.org. So this is the laundry list of pass-oriented user groups all around. Somewhere on there, uh, see, uh, find a local chapter. Uh, it's in the upper right. Okay. Or towards the right. There we go. So it, find a local chapter. If it were any chapter. bigger, it would have hit me. Danny, what state did you grow up in? Illinois. Okay, so let's do a uh, uh, pass region, United States. There's Canada, Canada U.S. US. Uh, let's see, uh, Illinois, so Midwest Heartland, I think is what they call it. Okay. Pick one, it doesn't matter, and just search. All right. So uh, I can pretty much guarantee if you're anywhere near a major city, there are going to be some past chapters nearby. Awesome. I've awesome. benefited a lot from being involved. See, in Michigan, you show where you live by holding up your hand. Uh -huh. I'm right smack dab in mid-Michigan, so I'm not far from Grand Rapids, a little more than an hour. Not far from Detroit, a little more than an hour. So I'll participate in both user groups. And most recently, uh, I was able to speak in our Detroit user group. A lot of fun there. And, and again, just want to point out that as with the last website we showed you, there are lots of international chapters available as well. I just very quickly pulled up some of the Asia Pacific chapters. There are others in Latin America and Europe as well. So again, great resource and it, being able to connect with folks that have the same interests, the same professional responsibilities can be invaluable. So yeah, good stuff. All right, so that concludes uh, this particular segment. One more segment left. And that definitely would be it. an important and a very interesting segment, something I've put a lot of time and, uh, and enthusiasm into, and that's high availability. So we're going to take a short break, and uh, after that, yeah. session six of six. Oh, my goodness, we're coming to the end. Oh, no, I'm disappointed. See you back here at the top of the hour.